I'm pleased to be joined today by Deb Harlan, Acting Executive Director, and Stacy Sullivan, with a very long title, Acting Director of Information Research and Professional Development at the Helen Keller National Center. Welcome, Deb and Stacy. We're so happy that you could join us today. First off, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the Nas Helen Keller National Center for those of us who know very little about it. Sure. So this is Deb. And um, I am um, really happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, the Helen Keller National Center was um, actually authorized as an act of Congress, and that was back in 1967. Um, we are located in Sands Point. We have um, Sands Point, Long Island, New York, and we have a dormitory here on location in our campus. And um, our Sands Point location was built in 1976. Um, we started seeing people in 1976 from across the country who came here and for vocational and rehabilitation training. The people that we serve are people who have, are deaf blind or have combined vision and hearing loss. So deaf blind doesn't necessarily mean like Helen Keller with deaf blind where, there, where Helen Keller didn't have any vision or hearing but deaf blind um, can mean people who have um, that may be blind and hard of hearing that may have um, some usable vision, some usable hearing, may um, be deaf and losing their vision, um, but still have some uh, very usable vision. So it's a wide variety of people that we serve. And we serve people that from um, who are youth, um, through um, adults. And recently we started providing services to 14 year olds that transition now in many states starts at 14. So we have programs that uh, provide training to youth as well as um, seniors. So we, we see a wide variety of people. We are the, um, the one national comprehensive, we're the only national comprehensive vocational training program for deaf, blind youth and adults in the country. So um, people come here for that vocational training, rehabilitation training. Um, we provide, um, so employment services, we um, provide orientation and mobility services, communication services. Um, we have case management services. We provide adaptive technology um, independent living and um, audiology and low vision. So um, we're all in one place. Um, we also have 10 regional um, offices across the country. And those 10 regional offices are, are uh, provide referral and professional training, um, technical assistance, to um, folks out in the field that are service providers, but also people who are deafblind across the country. We have right now 11 deafblind specialists in different places across the country. They also provide one-on-one -on -one employment services and rehab training. We have um, three right now youth services coordinators in three different states, and they are just focused on working with youth who are transition age. Um, and we provide summer programs. And um, recently those summer programs, we are able to provide them. Those are specifically for youth. Um, we're, we are going to start to provide them during the year as well, during you know um, school breaks, that type of thing. So um, it's really a comprehensive program here. Um, and uh, we also have professional development and I'm gonna let Stacy talk to you about that. Sure. So on top of uh, providing direct training to deafblind individuals, we also provide training to the professionals, the providers, and the family members who support those individuals who are deafblind. And we do this in three different formats. The first is our typical seminar, which is very unique, where individuals from all around the country come to the center. We have 
a, a, a wonderful conference room, but we, they typically stay for three days to a week. And we have a dorm on campus where they stay in the evening. So all day long is training and hands-on activity. We're very much about hands-on because in the deafblind world, training is done and learning is, is accomplished through touch. So we very much believe in that touch and getting up and actually practicing and doing things. So when people come to the center, not only do they hear from the staff at the center, many of whom are deafblind professionals, but they also meet with many of our students. We have panels and we have hands-on practice. Sometimes they go, a mobility class might go out into the community and actually practice the skills that they learned out in the community under the supervision of a certified uh, mobility instructor that works at Helen Keller and work with our students and get their feedback. And in the evenings, they go out and, and get feedback from our, our students and, and socialize with the students at the center. The two other formats are we provide training in people's home communities. So whether actually going to the agency or going to the community of the individual that's being served and provide training in their home. So our staff fly out to them or a regional rep meets with them. And the third is online training, which we were a little late to the game with online training, but thank goodness we started it in today's day and age. Um, because we were all about that touch and everything had to be in person. And about 10 years ago, we realized our impact was, was not as much as it should be. So we started um, really focusing on online training specifically for the professionals and the family members. And we've grown tremendously. It was a big learning curve for us. Um, but now we have about 25 courses on our platform that we've developed and a ton of resources and courses for family members and consumers that are free. Our other courses have CEUs. So that's a big portion of what we do is professional development. That's really exciting. Um, and you know, CTA Foundation is absolutely thrilled to be able to support your program, especially the one for older adults. Um, uh, and I wanted to ask you, since you represent such a wide range of people that you service, what are the unique challenges that older adults who are losing their hearing and their vision face? And how do you address those? So I, I this is Deb, I can start with that. Um, there, we have um, actually a senior adult specialist who um, works for us. He is one person for the country, but um, we do focus a lot on um, providing professional development to um, people who work with seniors across the country. Um, we also provide um, a, a confident living program, which uh, supports individuals who are seniors 55 and better. Um, they, the basic program is that they will come to the center and um, they will be immersed in um, all of the different uh, fields and the, um, the different areas that we provide training in at the center. And they will learn um, about what is out there that will support them with their combined vision and hearing loss. Um, we, Mark also, our senior adult specialist also will travel to different states and provide this type of training too. Um, and uh, he'll talk about um, independent living skills and adapting their environment and um, low vision techniques and uh, we'll discuss mobility and communication strategies. Um, our big challenges with seniors is um, first of all, the, uh, the number of people that has been estimated across the country who are deaf blind by a recent uh, Malloy College study is 2.4 million. And so that includes people with combined vision and hearing loss. Um, so based on that study, um, they had been basing a lot of their um, estimates on the American Community Survey. With that survey, you can see that the percentage of people that say that they have both vision and hearing loss doubles after the age of 50. So this is the biggest population 
that really need services across the country. The vocational rehab um, agencies across the country and that whole program itself is very focused now and the majority of the money is really put into providing employment. So people who are employable are going to get jobs. We're working with them. That's where the money is right now. For people who are retired, not going back to work, senior population, not a lot of services anymore. There are some in the States, but there is not a lot of focus on that area. So we're trying to really encourage other agencies to work with individuals who with combined vision and hearing loss. So not only do you have challenges of someone who may never have had a vision loss or a hearing loss, and now because they're older, they have age-related vision and hearing loss, and they may not really realize what that combination does. Because what we do is we may use our hearing to enhance our vision and our vision enhances our hearing. We use both senses in combination. So when there's a loss of one and then a loss of the second, you don't always realize how much you're relying on the second one to enhance that first one. And so people may not realize how much that's affecting them. So um, we, you know, we actually will help provide that information to people. Um, and then at the same time to professionals, because there may be professionals that work with people that just have vision loss, that don't really understand the effects of a combined vision and hearing loss. Um, so we really have to start looking at training those professionals too, that what that difference, how, what a difference that makes when you have those combined losses. Um, so, and then you have all the other challenges that come with with seniors, you know, physical, other physical issues, memory loss. There's sometimes um, a lot of grief with the vision and hearing loss. So there's mental health issues as well on top of it. So there are a lot of challenges um, with that population. So can you tell us a little bit about the program that the CTA Foundation has funded through Helen Keller? Sure. So the CTA Foundation, um, has generously awarded us um, a grant to develop a um, online training for people who are service providers that are working with individuals that are seniors with combined vision hearing loss. So they might be rehab teachers, other rehab uh, professionals, even maybe um, some medical professionals that are coming into the home, but it's um, to really teach those professionals about the technology and focusing on the technology needs of these consumers. Um, it's very challenging with folks that are um, seniors to really, they may not have really developed any tech skills previous or very basic technology skills. Now we're looking at adaptive technology. So um, what we're, we're providing is an online course for these rehab teachers so that they can understand the best ways and the effective methods of teaching seniors how to um, use technology for, and our big focus is for communication purposes. Because um, a lot of these folks have lost their ability to communicate on the phone perhaps, or um, you know, without adaptive devices, um, perhaps just, um, picking up a smartphone they've never done before, but maybe now they can use text messaging, screen enlargement on computers, um, the use of refreshable braille that can be used to send text messages or emails or even search the web. So there's a, a lot of um, this different technology that we're trying to, um, that we want to show professionals how to teach to um, seniors with combined vision hearing loss. It's amazing that these technologies have come forward to help in so many different ways. It's really exciting. Um, I know this has been a challenging year for everyone. 
how has your organization adapted and kind of what are the silver linings? What are the great things that you've actually seen work in this year for your population? Okay, I think I can answer that one. Um, when this, when the, the pandemic first hit, we were initially in shock because as I had mentioned, we rely on touch. You know, m many of our students communicate through tactile sign language. So when we had to close the center, we really didn't know what we were going to do moving forward. But immediately we all, um, you know, met together. We got creative. We tried to think outside of the box. And we were very thankful because recently we had just started a project, um, a research project. We had started piloting it recently where um, individuals, some of our students continued their braille instruction via distance learning. And that was the first time we had really done any virtual learning. What was happening was our students typically finish the other areas of training, whether it be mobility, technology, independent living, those areas of uh, training were finished earlier and braille typically takes a lot longer. So we were trying to figure out a way that the student could go home and continue our braille instruction. And there was a lot of trial and error and we were able to use the information and the experiences that we learned during that pilot project mm -hmm. to apply to this situation in real time. So we quickly got things um, situated and we've had a lot of success. What we're doing is using a combination of technology, a combination of cameras. We're meeting with students. Many of our students have some residual vision or, and or hearing. So they're able to communicate somewhat. It might be a progressive vision loss, a progressive hearing loss. So some of our, our students are able to communicate via sign or um, speech one-on-one -on -one with their instructors. Others, we're pulling interpreters into um, the homes. Everybody's masked up, of course, and taking um, precautions, but an interpreter is placed in the home or family members involved um, with the training, which we've heard a lot of positive feedback about because the family member is learning alongside the um, student and is getting is learning about what accommodations and what the student's experiencing. So we're getting a lot of positive feedback that way as well. Um, Another very positive outcome, the silver lining, is I was just recently interviewing um, a young woman yesterday, and she was explaining, as had many others, that they'd like to see this virtual training continue as an option, mm -hmm. because she's noticing on top of people's schedules and having to give up everything to come to the center, but on top of that, she's getting feedback from her own home. She's getting feedback, they're seeing her kitchen, they're seeing what she uses in her home and, and the lighting or in for mobility classes, they're seeing her environment and giving feedback related to her environment. Mm -hmm. Where Helen Keller is a wonderful place, but we kind of call it this magic fairy place because every all the services are in place, all everybody can communicate with you, everything is accessible. So to do the training actually in your own home, um, we've we found some definite positive um, outcomes and we hope to continue this as, as an option for students. That's great, That's really fantastic. Are there um, other new and emerging technologies that you think hold promise for the future? Well, um, some of the, um, the home or the um, Internet of Things um, technologies. So the home technologies we really are very interested in because that will keep people at home. Um, what we're seeing is that a lot of those technologies are voice-based and some of our um, consumers really can't access that. So it would be really kind of cool if they could keep that keyboarding or some type of uh, a, alternative access to that, uh, those types of um, um, technologies, I think would be really great. You could see better adaptations for um, medical devices, things like that. Anything that would support someone to stay at home and you know live where they're comfortable, that type of thing. And it's, it's really nice. I mean, my, I see my in-laws using Alexa, you know, and, um, 
I, I would like to see some uh, people that um, have combined vision hearing loss still be able to utilize something like that too um, for themselves. You had a, an idea too, Steve. I just had one tiny idea. One of my very good friends and colleagues is deafblind and she uses a braille display and it is amazing what people can access on a braille display nowadays. But we'd like to see something, she's a runner and there's no way to communicate a short um, piece of information, pick me up, there's an emergency without a braille display on you. So we've been, we've been reaching out to a lot of people exploring some way to communicate with someone who's fully deaf blind uh, via text without a big braille display on you. So that's something we had in mind. Yeah, kind of a Fitbit for- a Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, well, Speaking of Fitbit um, and other technologies, we are here at CES 2021, and um, there's so many interesting, innovative things that are new to all of us. Um, are there special topics of interest to you personally? Doesn't necessarily have to be related to the Helen Keller National Center. Well, um, I, I think that um, for it's, everything is just so interesting. I went to CES a few years ago and just had you know, all kinds of things, new TVs, and there was actually the 3D printer, which I thought was like most awesome. Now it's everywhere, you know? So um, there's so many things, but um, I just kind of would want to um, have people think as they develop technologies that they should think about accessibility and really think about this, um, you know, that this whole group of people that we could so much benefit from um, having accessibility on anything that is new and innovative, you know. So um, that's kind of where I was going with that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, there's other things too that I was thinking about, like technologies for um, language translation. That's really, really interesting to me. Wouldn't it be nice though, if you could have captioning, you know, um, just immediately on anything. So for someone who is deaf could um, access anything with good solid captions that are not messed up a lot, you know, so that, that we could develop the better um, uh, technology for really translation to, to captions. It might be cool at some point in time to have ASL be translated so someone who is signing could have what they're signing translated um, immediately um, without the use of an interpreter in some situations. Um, wouldn't that be a kind of a neat technology to have? So uh, those are things on top of my head right now. Yeah. Another thing that I would mention is um, the new apps now, this Seeing AI app. It's amazing. You can put it on um, a device, a, a, a can of soup or a person, and it'll uh, identify what the item is, who the person is, if you... If you um, pre-set up the system that this person is, you match the face with the, with the person and they'll, they'll let the person know who's just walked in their room. Oh, yeah. Jeff has just walked in my room or this is a can of soup or I can read my print mail. So I think, I think technology has just opened up the world for this population and it's just incredible. That's really amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's happening so fast when it's you think so about, fast. you know, even a few years. It's really remarkable. Um, well, you do such incredibly good service um, and I don't know who else would step in and do the work that you're doing. So thank you so much for, for all that you do. If people want to learn more about the Helen Keller National Center, how can they do that? They can go to our website, um, go to helenkeller.org slash HKNC and um, we have all of our services are on our website. And um, please do take a look through there. We have a lot of online courses right now. They're free for professionals too. So um, just a little <laughs> push towards that. Um, but yeah, um, I would love people to check out our website. Um, 
they can. That would be terrific. We also have a um, we have a series of uh, we have uh, regional representatives across the country on our website. You can find the address, phone number, um, email for our regional representatives. And um, if you are in need of services, please do reach out to them, and uh, they are willing and ready, able to help you. Well, thank you so much, Deb and Stacy. It was really a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I really appreciate the CTA Foundation absolutely supporting us in, in our endeavors. Thank you very much for that.